that the something not nothing doesn't prove a designer, certainly doesn't prove a deity, it certainly doesn't prove a deity who cares about you or intervenes in your life or who supervises you waking and sleeping, but nonetheless, it's a thought that has to be confronted. I'll just close by saying what, what I've contributed, I think, myself to this argument, um, which is the following. Um, as we now know, because of Edwin Hubble and many others, the universe is expanding very, very fast, has been ever since the original Big Bang, and the rate of expansion, which not even Hubble quite predicted, Lawrence Krauss worked this out a few years ago, is not slowing down, as Newtonians might thought, it's increasing. The rate of the expansion is increasing, the redshift light. So very, very soon there won't even be any evidence in the cosmos that there ever was a Big Bang. Things will be have flown so far apart. And in the meantime, and you can see it in the night sky, the Andromeda galaxy is headed directly towards ours, as it has been doing since long before we could think about such things. So very soon, what something we have will be replaced by a whole lot of nothing. So who designed that? What divine father arranged that for us? What caring person who watches over bedsides and gives people hope uh, design things that way? I ask you, there's only one way to grow up, and it is to stop believing that there is either a tyrannical or a benign parent who's looking out for you. In my opinion, that tyranny would be much worse if it was benign, but you have your choice. No, thank you for asking. I, I, know I'm, I know I have a tendency to talk too much, don't I? Um, do you wish I'd talk less? Never mind. No, never mind. Look, I think it's very important to distinguish the numinous, uh, the numinous from the supernatural or the superstitious. The numinous or, you might want to say, the transcendent. Um, for example, I'll make it quick. I wrote a book about the Parthenon, um, a building I can't tire of. Um, there are so many ways of looking at it from the outside, from the inside, its measurements, its symmetries, the, the stories told by its mutilated sculpture, uh, the, the interiority and the exteriority of it, its positioning in the ancient world. Really, I, you could, a, a good person interested in aesthetics could, could give a life to the study of the thing. Um, but I have no conviction at all about the cult of Pallas Athena, which inspired its being built. I don't think the cult of Pallas Athena was uh, a valid religion. I don't think it I, I think it was a man-made cult. I have no belief that the Eleusinian mysteries held any real mystery. I think, they, I think it was a piece of priestcraft. I'm sorry to say that it looks very likely as if one of two of the stories on the frieze actually are about a human sacrifice to propitiate uh, a, a, a bad god. And um, I think Athenian imperialism in respect of um, not just uh, Sparta, but the, the Delian and, and Melian islands was, was a terrible tyranny. Nonetheless, I wouldn't be, I couldn't be, could not be without that temple. So one of the great cultural and aesthetic tasks, I think, is separating the numinous, the transcendent, the beautiful, and the aesthetic from the superstitious and from the supernatural, which is a dimension that doesn't exist and that we don't need and that can't help us. May I? Do you want to yeah. jump in? Sure, sure, I'd love to. Um, I, 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 first of all, I think that the here is really an area where we agree. I also don't hold with the cult of Pallas Athena. And um, I think that for us to find these commonalities is important. But, and, and by the way, I really am honestly intrigued by the peremptory statement that there is no supernatural. Because if we're talking about intellectual arrogance on the part of the believer, how can one say that as opposed to, it seems to me there's not a persuasive case for the supernatural, to, to say that there is no realm of the supernatural is taking an awful lot on oneself, I think. But that, was, that wasn't actually the point Nothing that I wanted to like make. Nothing the other way around. Right, well, um, it was this. I believe that the reason you have a place like Pallas Athena is because human beings actually grope towards something real, though it finds many different kinds of expressions. And the reason that that's so, in part, is because we know that we live in a world in which the intangible matters. Not just intangible as we're experiencing right now, right? I'm saying words to you which are essentially intangible. You're hearing them. They're changing something about you. The physical world is changing because of the intangibility of thoughts, ideas, words, all of that. 
And so we have an intuition that, as Emerson said, uh, you know, the unseen things are eternal and uh, the things that we see are temporal. That is, that they're, they don't last forever, but the intangible does. But the second part of this is that the reason that consciousness seems to me so important is that we dwell in this world that we actually can't explain physiologically. And we do have intuitions that aren't a function purely of firing synapses. And not everything can be explained by neurons. And the world is a remarkably fine-tuned, if you're interested, I have a little section on that that gives you some of the statistics in the book that Mr. Hitchens has by him called Why Faith Matters. Um, and those things, that is the idea that there are things that we cannot prove, that we cannot see, that are what we call euphemistically intuition, those things were real to ancient Greeks as they are real to us. And even though their expression finds different cultural forms, to assume that they are not real is to flatten out the world in a way, I think, that is not true to any of our experience. And you have to do violence to human experience to assume there is not an intangible realm as opposed to honoring it. Uh, just a, a note to the audience that um, if you have questions that you want to have submitted up here, now is a good time to write them down and you'll find people who will collect them because we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. Um, I wanted to ask you both, uh, in, in reading your works and, um, and, and reading about you, um, you've both made major changes uh, in, your, in your thinking and your outlook as adults. Um, David, in your book, you talk about uh, as the son of a rabbi at a tender age, 11 or 12, uh, after seeing a, a very uh, gory Holocaust film, uh, that you became an atheist and figured, uh, how could there be a God? Mm -hmm. and, and that lasted for a number of years till you till you were a young adult and um, eventually became a rabbi. But we'll have to read the whole book to find out how, right. how that happened. Um, Christopher, from, from the opening pages of your book, you talk about when you were nine years old, you sort of saw through the God that uh, your teacher was talking about. But I guess certainly politically, you uh, have changed from someone from the from the left to uh, perhaps it was after 9-11, but became a, a supporter of the Bush administration carrying out the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, went from writing from magazines on the left to those on the right. I wondered if you could both talk just a little bit about, um, about change, which is a very uh, popular word these days, um, and how you came to question your long-held beliefs and and what you learned from that. You want me to do first? Okay. I, um, I, I think that for me, at least, it was a function of learning to distrust my certainty. Um, when I was 17, I knew everything. I realized that that was a, a, a defense. And as I came to know, I mean, this is part of the pensive illusion as opposed to a reality problem. And I, I talk about this in the book, and I must say Mr. Hitchens is only glancingly guilty of this tonight, but I think that it's a common um, rhetorical strategy of uh, people who are, um, and the older I got, the more I argue the atheist case, they'll refer their own beliefs to reason and yours to psychology, right? In other words, I believe what I do because it makes sense. You believe what you do because you're childish, or because you had a bad mother, or because you had a bad father, or because you need a crutch. Um, but my beliefs are beliefs of reason. And I very much thought that. I thought religious people were weak, and they were credulous, and they were uninformed, and I wasn't. But as I got older, and I learned about the lives of people whom I admired, and started to reason, and yours to psychology. Right? In other words, I believe what 